you don't know much about Pella Communities, we are uh, mission-oriented in that we desire to be in low-income areas, to serve those areas tangibly, uh, as we also uh, preach the gospel uh, spiritually. And so there's an element to our ministry that is pretty intentional. Um, and actually, that's, it's a perfect segue to, I have two quick announcements uh, for you. So this coming weekend is a really important weekend for us at Pella Communities, okay? Two doors down, uh, I think everyone at this, know, at this point knows, but if you don't, that's okay. We bought that building, so it is ours, which is super exciting. 6,200 square feet. We still got to raise some. Yeah, Nick is excited. I appreciate that, okay? Um, so this Saturday starts our official, as a church, we get to go in there and start breaking things, okay? Our goal is to clear out the entire space. We want exposed ceilings and brick walls, and so we've got a lot to clear out. A lot of walls, dry walls. We got to remove a lot of ceiling tiles. So this Saturday, there are two different shifts. If you want to be part of that, we're going to try to get as many people as possible. Uh, come this Saturday, we'll provide lunch. We're going to go in there, and if you want to just pick up stuff and throw it away, or you want to swing a sledgehammer, or maybe you don't want to do either, we're going to actually clear out the seats in this room, put the kids in here to provide some child care. If you just want to watch the kids, put a movie on, and this will kind of be our, our home base for snacks and, and lunch and all that stuff. So um, anyway, that's this Saturday, two different shifts. Shoot me an email, sean at pellacommunities.com if you want to be part of that, uh, but we're going to do that this Saturday. And then the next day, so a week from today, um, is uh, going to be a pretty important Sunday for us. So uh, we're going to take a break from 2 Corinthians next week. And the reason that we're going to do that is uh, we're going to talk about what it means to be part of a church. Um, we feel like as we start to slowly make the transition to this, uh, to this mission and really start to be about all that we talked about being about in this area and starting those ministries, we feel like it'd be a good Sunday for um, us to lay out what that means uh, really tangibly, but then also afford everyone the opportunity to get plugged in. So let me tell you real quick the questions that are asked a lot. How do I get discipled at Pella, okay? How do I be a part of what we're doing in outreach? And how do I join a community? Those are three things that we're asked constantly. So what we're going to do is after service next Sunday, we're gonna walk out these doors. That room will be cleaned up. That area will be cleaned up. You'll get to tour what will be our, our mission, uh, two doors down. But also in there, there's gonna be tables set up, community board set up. So if you wanna volunteer uh, with what we're doing in the neighborhood, or you wanna volunteer here on Sunday with sound, or you wanna volunteer in communities, or you wanna join a community, or you wanna be discipled, or you wanna help with setup, or you wanna help with kids, all that is next Sunday. So if you've been trying to figure out how do I get plugged in at Pella Communities, next Sunday we are devoting the entire Sunday to that cause, okay? So just an FYI. That was last week I was not preaching so that Brandon and I can learn the ways of the ninja uh, from Johnny who does all the sound stuff. He, if he died, we would have no idea how to do sound. So somebody had to learn it. So let's give it up for Johnny. He likes all the attention. You can't see him, but he's there. Um, so let me pray for us, and we're going to jump into our, our text, okay? Father, thank you again just for who you are. Thanks for the ability to study uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We pray now that you would illuminate the text, meaning we need your help uh, for our ears to hear it, and our eyes to see it, and our minds to understand it, and our hearts to believe it. So please, Lord, meet us here. We love you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start our time with a study uh, that I read about. In 2018, Oxford did a study uh, on social norms, specifically in the larger uh, bracket of uh, anthropology. And um, in studying this, what they wanted to find out what was um, different when certain uh, things would happen with a human as they would interact with one group and then they'd go to interact with another group. And they started with uh, animals. I'm going to get rid of the watch here. They started with animals to see what this looks like. And so they started this study in 2018 with chimpanzees. And essentially what they did is they taught um, chimpanzees to break these certain nuts so that they can eat them. And then they would move these chimpanzees around to see their behavior as they showed them different ways to crack these dif different nuts. And this is what they um, uh, found in their study. Here's their quote. Our study found that when chimpanzees, uh, when a chimpanzee learns an efficient way to crack nuts open as a member of one group and then switches to a new group that uses a less effective strategy, it will avoid using the superior nut cracking method just to blend in with the rest of the chimps. In our studies, humans are similar. There is tremendous eternal pressure, internal pressure to comply with the norms of the group. Whenever we are unsure how to act, we look at a group to guide our behavior. We are constantly scanning our environment and wondering what is everyone else doing. 
So the study found, specifically with the chimpanzees, they found this really easy way to crack this nut, okay? This is a simple way. Well, then they went over here to this uh, chimpanzee group and it took like five different steps to do it, but they didn't want to seem like a crazy chimpanzee, so they're like, yeah, okay, right? So they started doing it, right? And what they found was, as they continued to uh, uh, play out this uh, experiment and these studies, is they found that to be true within um, uh, human studies as well. The study was fascinating uh, that Oxford put, put on. If you're interested, I can send it to you, but my point in, in saying this is, um, you know, we have a word for this or a few words, right? We have the term like peer pressure or social norms that we use in these ideas. And um, a, a lot of times those things could actually be good. I know they're always uh, chalked up as bad. You know, there's moments where peer pressure, if you're sitting in a group where there's a lot of accountability is a really good thing. The greatest example, of this would probably be AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? When you're in an environment, when you are uh, with other people who are kicking a habit and they're doing well and you start to feed off one another, peer pressure is a really good thing. What I have found though within the church is it hasn't been always the best thing. There have been moments, little glimmers of hope, but coming to faith in high school, me and my boys, like when we came to faith, we didn't have a background for any type of like Christianity. And so we started to like read the Bible and we were just all about this dude, Jesus. And we started to like intertwine with church homies. And like what we found was like, they were like telling us, so I remember me and my boy, Eric, we were sitting at Circle K just talking to people about Jesus. We were like 16, talking about people of Jesus. Hey, can we talk to you about Jesus? And they're like, who's this? Who? No, like, right? Well, we told our friends this and they're like, we don't do that, right? And early on, we didn't know it wasn't the cool thing to rock that like witness wear. So we were rocking the, sur the shirts that said Jesus saved my space in heaven, right? We had no idea. Like Abercrombie and Fitch, a breadcrumb and a fish, right? Like we had it all, okay? And we had no idea being all in about Jesus, like, like that wasn't like, hey, you don't want to be that dude. And, I, and, and what's interesting, as my walk with the Lord has gone on now, now I've been, say, I've been a believer longer than I have it in my life. I have found when I take on groups to disciple, usually the same thing takes place. Usually for good or bad, it always depends. But you know, you take a group of people and you say, we're gonna go through this year long process of discipleship. And inevitably what happens is if a few people start to slack on the reading, not taking it very serious, usually the group takes on that norm. And, and here's why, why I say that. The, the opposite's true. When people are all about it, it's all about it. But here's why I bring this up. Today, what our text is going to point us towards is removing the veneer of American Christianity and stop processing all of our counterparts around us to go, hey, what does it look like to follow Jesus Christ? And Paul's gonna go, let me tell you what it looks like and let me show you in my life what it's looked like. And so there's not a lot of messing around when we read the New Testament in following Jesus. And so let me give you a point uh, as reference here in verse one when it says this, working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, verse one of chapter six has to be understood in the context of what it was just, uh, what was said in chapter five. Alric broke down chapter five, but the last verse in chapter five is perfect. Like, um, you gotta think, no verse numbers, no chapters. It goes from what we understand to be verse 21 into 6-1. Listen to what verse 21 said. The last verse in chapter five, it said this, uh, and I don't have this on the screen, so you can turn your Bibles there or just listen. It says this, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I'm not gonna break it down. Alric took that last week. But what I want you to hear is, here's God. He makes Jesus who did not sin become sin. He becomes sin so that we can, now here's the word. I need you to hear this. This word is gonna be paramount for us to understand our entire text. This is what uh, uh, sets the trajectory for us. We become the righteousness of God. Okay, do you hear the word there? We become the righteousness of God. Verse 21 is about what we are. More appropriately, what we've been made to be. Because of Christ's work, we are now something. We didn't earn that, Christ did that, and now we are the righteousness of God. We've been made righteous. We are something, okay? Now, in being made something, in being made righteous, I want you to look at the first word in the next verse. Verse one, chapter six. The first word is, Work. Because you've been made into this work. There's no other relationship that we can navigate in marriage or with our kids, in friendship, school, whatever it is, where we've received love, we've received mercy, and we don't respond with a proper response of work. Let me do something in response to that. No marriage survives if that's the case. 
We have to recognize because we've received grace in that now we are the righteousness of God. We're not earning this grace. We've, been be, we've become the righteousness of God. We've been given this grace. The proper response is now do something. Hear me, like remove it. Remove the like, you don't need to wake up just a little bit early to get in your word. Like work, work with your mind. Read past the, 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 the one verse a day. Work with your heart. Really wrestle with text. Really wrestle with what it means to follow Jesus. Work with your hands. Work with your feet. Get off your butt. Talk to your neighbor. Work. Work. This is something important for us to hear as we process what it means to be a Christian because Paul's making a declaration of who we are, responding with what that means now for us, and then he gives us why. You want to know why it matters, why we need to work? Because if we don't, listen to what he says at the back half of this verse. We appeal to you to not receive the grace of God in vain. If we don't respond, like, the, like grace is uh, necessary, but works are inevitable, like we, we understand that grace go, comes upon the receiver and the receiver naturally has to respond with something. And so what we find here is Paul's declaration is because you've become this, now work. And if you don't, you've received the grace of God in vain. It's a vapor. It doesn't exist. It's not real. Dare I say, you're not a Christian. So what do we do with this, right? Because this could conjure up all kinds of things. Wait, so I have to work to earn my salvation? Like what, what, is, what does that mean? Well, it's actually super helpful for us to see what he ties uh, that, that word working there. Working together with him. Together with him, uh, the subject's in, uh, um, assumed, it's not there in the Greek, but uh, the reason it's there in the ESV and most translations put it there is, uh, it's the word synegratus in Greek. You can hear what word we get from, uh, from that, synegratus. It's where we get our word synergy from. And the idea is found in James 2.22, uh, Romans 8. It's like when faith, works together with uh, uh, works or uh, God's sovereignty and his providence works together with all things that are working together. The same idea that's going on is the idea that separate, um, we create something more than we would apart, right? That's the word synergy from. And, and what you need to hear in this and why it's important is um, the order matters. So you can go, well, what does it mean to work? Well, the order matters here because it doesn't say God is working with you. It says, we are working with God. Let me give you an example. At the end of my senior year in high school, I needed a job. I needed it bad, apparently, because I ended up working for a small landscaping company with my boy Chappie. His dad owned a landscaping company, and so I worked with uh, him, and it was the middle of the summer in Phoenix working landscaping, okay? Now, you can imagine, it was awful. We had to get up at like 2.30 because we'd be picked up at three, and we had to be to get the trucks at 3.30 because we had to start work at like four because I don't know if you know this, if you try to work like past one in the middle of the summer in Phoenix, you will die if you're outside. And so we, uh, we, we had it to be done real early. Now, what's interesting is because it was a small company, there was about three of us who did a lot of the work, but um, the guy who owned the company, he would be working with us. Now, it's important to understand that when I say he's working with us, because the reality is he wasn't really working with us. We were working with him. He would go, he would know if, if we had to put in sprinkler systems or we had to move trees or whatever it was, he knew exactly what needed to be done. And he was telling us what to do <clears throat> while he was doing it with us. Okay. And so it was his company. He's doing it. Uh, but we are now working with him to do this. And so uh, the same idea, uh, you know, when we have this process of sanctification, what it means to work with God, what it means to follow God, what it means to work out our salvation, in this moment, this process of sanctification, it's like a, a fine dance. He's leading us. And so as we go about doing this, we're working with him. Here's what I got to say. And if you're not a believer, this might be confusing to you. Ask him. What does it mean to work? What does it mean to, to, to work and not mean great, make grace in vain? Ask him. And this is, this is, that in itself is part of the working. Get in your word and find out. Like spend time before the Lord and go, Lord, do you want me to do this? And trust that he'll speak. Like you, you gotta ask him. You're working with him. You're working with him. He's doing something. Be a part of what he's doing in your own life. Now, Paul's going to double down on this in a fascinating way. I really like the word fascinating, apparently. Um, I want you to look at verse two. It says this. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. 
Behold, now is the day of salvation. It seems pretty random that Paul would just quote Isaiah 49, but the reason he's doing this, quoting this here, and then flipping it on its head is, is really intentional. So Isaiah 49 is quoting this moment when the people of God in the Old Testament have just been rescued out of bondage and slavery from Babylon. Uh, they were in what is called exile. They were rescued out of it. And so Isaiah 49, God is declaring, I rescued you. What, what he says in this moment uh, is, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. And Paul's flipping it on its head and he's saying, you think, as he's talking to the audience there, you think that that salvation was great for you to be rescued out of physical bondage. But today I'm telling you, you can be rescued out of real spiritual bondage. You can be rescued out. Today is the day of salvation. That's why he ends up going on to turn it on its head. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But he's not just quoting the Old Testament and saying this. Paul's really creative, honestly. There's moments when I read the scripture sometimes, and if you take time to study it, and you see something, you go like, that's, cr-. like, it just, it had to be spirit-led in moments where you go, that's just too poetic and too creative to just for someone to randomly write on a piece of paper. So <clears throat> let me tell you what I mean. Um, there are statements that we use in our English vernacular all the time, phrases all the time, that we don't really know why we use them. Uh, don't Let's not beat around the bush or a dime a dozen. We use them and we know what they mean. If I say a dime a dozen, you mean, well, that's just cheap, right? But we don't know where that came from. You might, I don't know, maybe it came from eggs or something. I have no idea. Um, That's probably would make sense now that I think about it in real time. But we don't know when it started. There was a point in time when a certain statement, like beating around the bush, I have no idea where it came from. But I use it, right? It means you're not being clear around me. You're just beating around the, I know what it means. So statements and phrases that we use have a moment when they were the buzz of that time. A greatest example of this would be, let's start at square one or starting back at square one. That phrase came about in the 50s with the board game boom. And so everyone started using that specifically in America with the board game boom. And so now we know the term. If I say you got to start back at square one, you know what that means. You got to start all over, right? But maybe you didn't know where it came from. Well, the oldest known saying that I can find in Western philosophy is the word carpe diem, seize the day. Carpe diem was coined less than about 10 years from Paul writing this statement. Okay? Now, here's why this is important. A uh, uh, poet, Horace, is the one who coined the term. I read this article uh, on the BBC. It was really long, but it was a fascinating article on the term carpe diem in studying this whole uh, thing. And Paul, I, I really believe, as he lays out this, he's, um, you know, if I was to say um, America runs on Duncan, okay? We know a lot of, or if I go Red Robin, yes, we're, we're consumers. We're such consumers. Um, <laughs> We know these like slogans or terms, right? Uh, Like just like we know, it's like in the back of our mind. Like I didn't train anyone. Like this isn't a set audience where I go, okay, when I say Red Robin, you all do that. We just knew that, right? You didn't have to to get training for that. In the same way, slogans are in the back of of the original readers' minds all the time. They're in the back. And so when they hear something and I go, America runs on Duncan, and I can go, you know what? Let's take this term. America runs on Duncan. Let's be super cheesy for a moment. No, no, no. America needs to run on Jesus, right? Okay, I get it. It's cheesy. But if I take that term and I go, this is what needs to happen. America needs to run on Jesus. Well, I'm trying to take a term, change a little bit for us to see. That's what Paul does here. He takes the idea of carpe diem, seize the day, and he's taken that vibe. And I love, I'm so grateful for using commentaries because all the commentaries pointed to what Paul's doing here. In saying this term, seize the day, this BBC article said, at the time, the the poet Horace was saying, uh, hey, listen, you only, it's like a YOLO, you only live once, you're only gonna be, be able to experience so much pleasure, you're given today, so seize the day. Go out as much sex as you can have, as much money as you can hoard. Get yours. Get it all today. It was the the pinnacle of hedonism. Get it, get it, get it, right? Paul takes this term and he flips it on its head. And he's going, the vibe is, now is the day of salvation. And so as believers, they know that vibe out there is, get yours because of hedonism. And now Paul is saying, no, 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 listen. If you're saved, this is the idea of Hebrews 3, today's the day for obedience, You've been saved now. Walk this out. What are you waiting for? Work. Work. Get to work on this. You keep playing around. You keep messing around, but work. Now, what I think Paul does here from verses 3 through verses 10, which will be a little bit quicker uh, in a second, it gives us the example, I think, or gives us some things that we need to know about what this looks like. But before we get there, I want to just share something on this because I think 
it is, before we just get into Paul's example, there is something worth acknowledging that, um, you know, when, when somebody first comes to faith, usually there's this wrestle of like, what does it mean to be saved? And, and what does it mean now to work? And, and everything we're talking about, how it intertwines. Um, and I always end up giving at least a few chapters of a book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Now, if you've been a believer long enough, you've heard the term Dietrich Bonhoeffer or the word, the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer or the book, The Cost of Discipleship, but maybe you haven't. And if you're a new believer, I would highly encourage you to read The Cost of Discipleship, at least the first three or four chapters. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is most well known uh, for the guy who was part of uh, the cohort that uh, set out to kill Hitler during the Nazi regime. Uh, unfortunately, that's the main thing he's known for. But he was a pastor, he was an author, and he was a strong believer. And something that Dietrich Bonhoeffer realized, uh, I read his biography, it's called Bonhoeffer. It's a thick biography. I read it about three summers ago. You know, three-fourths of it is really about his experience coming to America, predominantly to African-American churches, and seeing the fervor of the Lord uh, in those churches. And then going back to Germany, teaching Sunday school classes, and just feeling like, well, the only example I can give is talking to homeschool or uh, Christian schooled kids. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, Christian schooled kids who went to a Christian school, it felt like, I don't know, they like didn't want any, they were there because their parents made them. But people, the kids who came, like we'd pick, go pick up in the hood and stuff, they wanted to be there. There was a clear dichotomy between these two groups. And this was Bonhoeffer's experience. When he came to America, the gospel was flourishing and thriving in these black communities. And he'd go back to Germany and they, they didn't care at all. And so he coined this term in the book. It's called cheap grace. He talks about these Germans who essentially go, hey, listen, you call yourself a believer, but you don't live it out. There's no life in it. And so he, he goes in on, on this, in the cost of discipleship, this idea of cheap grace. Let me read what is, seems like a fairly long quote, but I think it's worth reading the whole thing. Listen to how he describes cheap grace, and hopefully it, it perks us up a little bit and sobers us when it comes to uh, the gospel that we say we follow. It says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, Communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field for the sake of the man. Will gladly go out and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for, those who, for, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again and again. The gift which must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because, because, it, call, because it calls us to follow. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. It is grace because it gives a man the only, li uh, the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And it is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. Ye were, ye were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. This point is super simple. If God is willing to give his son for this, if God is willing to make you the righteousness of God, who are we to not act like it? This is his point. Now, Paul says, well, let's, let's examine my life for a second. Now, if you haven't been with us in 2 Corinthians, Paul does this a lot because um, he, you know, this is his fourth letter to the, the Corinthian church. Uh, this is described as the second letter, but it's, it's ultimately his fourth letter as we consider it canon in the New Testament. As he's been writing these letters, we've noticed in 2 Corinthians, he keeps referencing, you know, we've seen these moments where there's beef between him and the people. He's trying to justify his people, doubt his integrity. And so in this moment, he says it again. Look here in verse three. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we, con we commend ourselves in every way. Paul's saying this, listen, we didn't, we didn't put you off the rails. Uh, look, at, look at our lives. Here's our life. And now I want you to look. He gives us four lists, okay? Let's pay attention because let's look at Paul's example in these lists. This is Paul's example. He's the one living that out. Here's what he says. By great endurance in affliction, hardships, calamity, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, the power of God, 
with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. That last uh, statement there, before we get into verses eight through 10, I think is important. The, the New American Commentary, and I would agree, um, suggests that what he's, what this, the right hand and the left, Paul's trying to create these uh, juxtaposition. He's kind of go like, look at this and this and this, like on this side or on this side. Let me give you an example. Let me show you, I'm gonna show you two charts. Here's this first one. Here's a list of everything that Paul has said in, that, in uh, all those verses, verses four through seven. On the left is the way that Paul has lived according to these texts, okay? By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, power of God, weapons of righteousness. This is Paul acknowledging, I'm working for the grace that I've received. Here's what my life looks like, okay? Now, listen, if you ask, and this is not, I'm not trying to just be like, take, you know, shoot arrows all day at the American church, but it would seem to me from my perspective, a lot of believers that I talk to do not think that the list on the right will be the results because of the living of the list on the left. But that's what Paul said. We, for some reason, somewhere along the line, and maybe you already know this, but let me just remind you, it's good to be reminded you know, once or twice a year, whatever false promises were given to you that you would have some coast into heaven by following Jesus Christ, you were, you were lied to. Matter of fact, I was trying to tell the eight o'clock it's a trip sometimes because like I've had some buddies who um, their life is like really on point. They've got a new job and like they're making a good amount of money. They just bought a house and then they want to start talking to me about Jesus. And I'm super hesitant to talk about Jesus because I know what Jesus is going to do. He's going to ruin their life for their soul. And like, I'm like, oh man, if I tell you about Jesus, then you're going to lose everything and I'm going to be super happy and Jesus is going to be happy and you'll ultimately be happy, but it's only hell ahead of you. This is going to be terrible, but let's talk about Jesus, right? Like I just like, I've seen it and maybe you as believers have experienced this. It feels like the moment I start to pursue Jesus, everything falls apart. Our pets' heads are falling off. It feels like nothing is working the way that it's supposed to. And the reality is as we, we process Paul's life, that's true. As we process our Savior's life, obedience only brought death. It only brought death. This is Paul's um, example for us. So work, get at it, go after it. Hear me, it ain't gonna be easy. It ain't gonna be easy. Now, he goes on to continue to melee us with more of this from the left and the right, you know, kind of the same like for richer or poor um, in sickness and in health. We do with the, you know, marriage vows. It says this, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet uh, making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Paul seems to lay out the pathetic nature of the Christian life. And it would be pathetic if he doesn't remind us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, that if in this life we have hope only in Jesus Christ, then we are to be the most pitied of all people. If in Jesus Christ we did only have hope in this life, we are pathetic. We are pathetic. We're wasting our Sunday mornings to gather together to sing to nobody. We are pathetic and we are to be most pitied. But this list tells us something. Our hope isn't in this life. Our attention isn't meant to be focused on the here and now. Uh, what goes on in this list, the back and forth, is this list is to remind us that you are part of a kingdom that is upside down. And I wanna double down on that truth because I don't think it's just um, that it's, oh yeah, yeah, like, like uh, the, the world doesn't just understand the way that we live and so they accuse us of things. As a matter of fact, Paul, in the tune of the spirit, um, he echoes like strangely close to something we've heard before, okay? And it's actually the greatest sermon that has ever been preached before in Matthew 5. Jesus gathers disciples around with the crowds and he begins to preach a sermon. And the first part of this sermon, we call the Beatitudes. It's called the Sermon on the Mounts. The Beatitudes lay out this way of life that if we're sitting there listening to Jesus, we go, but Jesus, he's going, blessed are the poor. Wait, I'm sorry, did you say the poor are blessed? Yeah, yeah, blessed are the meek. The meek are blessed? Yeah, yeah, blessed are you if you're persecuted for righteousness. I'm sorry, did you just say we're blessed for being persecuted? He seems to turn this whole thing on its head. And I couldn't help but noticing how much Paul's list mimics the Sermon on the Mount, specifically the Beatitudes. So let me show you the second chart. I thought this was cool. If you're a Bible nerd, you'll like it. If not, it is what it is. 
Look at verses four and five again. In troubles, hardships, distress, and beatings, imprisonments, and riots. In Matthew 5:10, it says this, blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness sake. Verse six, chapter six in 2 Corinthians says, in purity, Matthew chapter five, verse eight says, blessed are the pure in heart. Chapter uh, six, verse eight in 2 Corinthians says, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters. Funny enough, Matthew 5, 11 says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. In verse 10 of chapter six in, sec, uh, six in uh, 2 Corinthians, it says, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Sound, sounds very similar to Matthew chapter five, verse four. Blessed are those who mourn. In verse 10 of chapter six, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything almost is the um, fulfillment of verse three, chapter five in Matthew, blessed are the poor. Now it's not a perfect match, but I think it's important to see what Paul um, is alluding to in all of this. And the reason this is important is Paul's reminding us, believer, listen, if you're trying to walk out this thing with Jesus and look for results that make sense in this lifetime and make sense with around you, something intangible, then you're going to fail every time. The only way you can process this thing with Jesus to go work for, to continue to uh, uh, search for the Lord, to hear his voice according to Acts 17, to grope for him in hopes that we'd find him for he's not far off from each one of us, to continue to do this again and again and again, you've got to understand that the results are not going to be what you want them to be. As a matter of fact, this life is not the promised reward. This life is not the promised reward. And so Paul just reminds us kind of in this simple way, look at my life. I'm telling you, I've been been and will continue to walk out following Jesus and it's not easy. I'm I'm falsely accused. This is not easy. You know what would be easy? Greed. Greed would be easy. Living out your sexual desires and fantasies, that would be easy. Looking at porn, that would be easy. Self-centeredness, that would be easy. Pride in getting yours, that would be easy. But believers, you're part of an upside down kingdom. This world is not our home. And so Jesus, he's like shredding away all the things that are not of his kingdom off of you daily as you work, as you work because you've become the righteousness of God. And so let me finish uh, with my man, Lewis. Um, You thought I was gonna say Spurgeon, but I didn't. Um, So in uh, in, uh, The Voyage of the Don Treader, It's part of the Chronicles of Narnia series that C.S. Lewis wrote. There's this part, and if you don't know anything about it, there's this land called Narnia where there's talking animals. I'll leave it at that. Um, And so we read, uh, Candace and I read uh, this story to our kids uh, probably about a year and a half ago. And we got to this point in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader that I thought was really poetic. And it was this moment where there's this really annoying character. He's so annoying in the book. He's kind of annoying in the movies, but he's so annoying in the book. And his name's Eustace. And he's this annoying kid that... Um, just doesn't stop talking. And what ends up happening is they come across all this treasure and he steals some treasure, specifically this bracelet. And in stealing this bracelet, his punishment, Narnia punishes him by curse of the gold, I have no idea. Um, He becomes this dragon, okay? And it's rough. In most of the book, he's this dragon constantly trying to remove the scales. He hates being a dragon. He's so sorry for what he did. He tries to remove it. He can't. Well, there's this talking lion, fun fact, um, named Aslan. And he's this Jesus figure in the Chronicles of Narnia series, this story. And so Aslan calls, uh, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Eustace over, calls Eustace over as a dragon. And he says, I'm going to remove this dragon skin off of you, Okay. And this is how Eustace describes it in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. He says, I was afraid of his claws, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt. He peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done to myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. Then he caught hold of me and threw me into the water and I saw I'd become, or uh, I turned into a boy again. Now, this is, this is the sort of Aslan, he's, he's ripping into and he starts to rip away these dragon scales, right? And he makes them, he throws them into the water, he kind of washed away and, and he's, he's a boy again. Now, when you read the account, what's fascinating is it's this crazy reminder that grace is stupid dangerous. I mean, it is scary dangerous because grace Um, it's calling for your politics. It's calling for your philosophies. It's calling for the way you want a parent. It's calling for the way you want a neighbor. 
It's calling for the way that you want to work. Grace is not okay with sitting on a throne with something else up there. It is sketchy dangerous. And it's going to go ahead and tear and tear and tear. And as long as you hold fast to it, it wants to continue to consume in all the best ways. And it is dangerous, but it is so good because it wants to continue to remove that dragon-like scale over our heart, the scales of greed, the scales of pride, the scales of sexual morality, the scales of our, our ties to nationality, our scales, our scales, our scales. It wants to remove. Grace is dangerous, but it is so good. My prayer for us that we would be reminded again and again that receiving grace is to not receive it in vain, and that means we are to work with him in having it. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, thank you for uh, your goodness and your grace towards us. In a passage like this, it's challenging to know that uh, we might not be murdered for our faith or persecuted or go hungry, um, but our brothers and sisters around the world are. And, uh, and in that way, uh, this grace you've given us can actually become pretty cheap fast. So I pray that you would challenge us to know what it means to live on mission in a world of plenty. I pray that you would show us what it means to follow you in a world where we're not lacking. Um, I pray, God, that you would continue to show us how we can sacrifice, how we can give, how we can partake, how we can work for the grace that we've received because we are the righteousness of God because of your work. We're thankful for that. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.